Hello again, young history students of ancient of the ancient world. And last week we went over um, the land of Mesopotamia and much of the ancient Near East, some of the greatest kings and uh, their great accomplishments. And we looked at why Mesopotamia, the land between the two rivers, is, in, in we, or well, we didn't look at, but we will see why that it is so radically different from Egypt, uh, which is where we are going for this lecture. And uh, the reasons why Egypt and Mesopotamia are so different in their outlook in the world and why they developed so differently, and I stress to you constantly the external pressures that were continuously put on the cities and empires of ancient Mesopotamia from Babylon to the Akkadians uh, all the way through the Assyrians that, that constantly people from the outside came in and also that the, the rivers were uh, unpredictable when they flooded and they decimated city after city year after year that there was just simply no way to predict um, when the flood was uh, was happening so Egypt might be described as the absolute polar opposite of Mesopotamia because it is a it has been described as an unchanging land why is it described as an unchanging land because of its geographical isolation it has no enemies anywhere near it. It is protected by the cataracts within the uh, Nile River. No one can come up the Nile. It is uh, largely protected by its, its deserts and then the Mediterranean Sea. So Egypt is able to develop in uh, relative security and harmony, and therefore it doesn't change a whole lot. It is able to to maintain its civilization and the only real disasters that befall it. Occasionally it is conquered from the outside, but uh, really only internal strife is what causes uh, political problems within Egypt. And Egypt itself, as I say, geographical isolation. You can see here this green river valley all along the Nile. And this, this black dirt is among the richest uh, for agriculture anywhere in the, the ancient world. And uh, when we will see with Rome that he who controlled Egypt controlled the food source for the entire ancient world. So Egypt supplies the grain for everywhere in the ancient world. And again, this Nile Valley is what is so important. If you have ever been to Egypt, you can literally see that uh, there you ha can literally stand on one area that is lush and green and beautiful and you can put the other foot on a barren desert. Uh, only along this Nile Valley is there, there uh, the ability to have any kind of agricultural. Therefore, 98% or 97% of Egypt is just totally uninhabitable wasteland, but it is only within this great Nile Valley and along uh, or along the Nile Delta and the Nile uh, River Valley, which is the great river that flows right down through the middle here of Egypt, um, is is where agriculture and civilization develops. So in many ways, Egypt can be thought of as the gift of the Nile. And the Nile floods are not like the ones in Mesopotamia, that they are uh, very predictable, that every year they, they, the water rises up slowly and brings uh, uh, fertility to, to all the lands in the Nile Delta. It, uh, it irrigates the crops, and it's quite manageable. It's not a scary thing. It's something that is loved. So I just wanted to give you a, a comparison because often the, the early peoples, ancient peoples, treated rivers and and uh, and mountains right this they have animistic qualities that they would pray to them and there is a, a great prayer to the nile that is is from an unknown author and it says hail to you o nile who rise from the earth and gives life to all of egypt if prayers of humans are granted and the waters rise the earth shouts for joy every belly is happy every back shakes with laughter Everyone eats. And compare this with the prayer of the righteous sufferer. 
uh, from, uh, from Mesopotamia. The rampant flood, which no man can oppose, which shapes the heavens and causes the earth to tremble, and in an appalling blanket it folds mother and child. It beats down the granary. It downs the harvest. Rising waters, grievous to the eyes of man, all-powerful flood. So you can see here a great contrast in how civilizations uh, saw their rivers and their flooding as being radically different. So Egypt is basically made up into... You can look at Egypt in two ways. You can look at Old Kingdom, Middle Kingdom, New Kingdom... Or you can look at uh, uh, political dynasties that, that go along with, with families. And for this, the sake of this lecture, we're going to only look at the kingdoms. So we will begin by looking at the old kingdom and some of the hallmarks of, of Egypt. And as I was saying, Egyptian agriculture is so key to the feeding of the entire ancient world. Um, and these these gentle floods allow for great agriculture and it allows these these dynasties these egyptian dynasties to develop and maintain a, a power base um, that uh, simply other other areas of the ancient near east could not do and when you have the development of great kings um they began to associate themselves with divinity. And this divinity comes from the sun. And there is this great cycle of, of birth, life, and death. And then finally rebirth uh, within Egyptian religion, within Egyptian chronology. And the sun is centered to all these things because it brings this agricultural productivity. Um, and it is everything is predictable in Egypt. So the sun rises, it brings warmth and light to the land, it brings fertility, it, uh, it descends in the west, and it rises again. So life, death, rebirth. And the Pharaoh's life cycle will be the same. It will follow a similar uh, route. And Pharaoh is so important because Pharaoh has this thing. It's called Mat, M-A-A-T, Mat. Um, and if the Pharaoh was doing his job, if he was appeasing the gods correctly, if he was, was, uh, was following all the divine ordinances, then his mat was doing well. And therefore there was agricultural productivity in the land. And this was the job of Pharaoh, was to ensure good mat. And in, as time went on, as because Pharaoh was seen as sort of this intermediary between the gods and human beings, um, their preparation for death and rebirth in the afterlife um, was seen to be just as important as as uh, their their current their lifetimes. So they would build these grand palatial structures, pyramids, um, which were were their tombs, and they were thought to be as just as important that Pharaoh would would uh, as the, as their palaces on earth that when pharaoh would uh, would take on power that he would immediately begin building his tomb so again life death rebirth in the afterlife egypt is organized in, into two major geographical sections you have lower egypt here which is the nile delta and then you have upper egypt which is uh, along the nile river valley and then uh, the, the uh, lesser political organization was basically these county-like areas we call gnomes. These aren't these uh, silly things that go in our gardens, um, but rather they are like a county, a, a small political unit where you would identify where you were from. It would be like saying, I'm from uh, Platte County, I'm from Jackson County, I'm from Johnson County. This sort of thing. This is how an Egyptian would identify themselves as being where they were from. It's a tribal region. And the Old Kingdom is uh, unified by the, the pharaoh Narma. So this is when Upper and Lower Egypt are united, and he moves the capital to Memphis. 
his great city. And Narmer, along with being a great general, uh, being a conqueror, he begins an architectural revolution in that he begins building huge stone structures and stops building everything out of mud brick. Remember in, in uh, Mesopotamia, they only built out of mud brick. Egypt will have a revolution and they will start building things out of stone. That's why everything in Egypt, or not everything, but many things in Egypt still remain to us this day and nothing basically has survived in uh, Mesopotamia because they built out of mud brick. And there's here you can kind of see the, the fun uh, Egyptian crown that the, uh, the white crown was of Upper Egypt and then the red crown was of Lower Egypt and once uh, Pharaoh uh, Narmer unites the kingdoms, he unites the crown. So the, you have the, the cobra crown and the double crown. So you can't talk about Egypt without talking about pyramids. And as I said, these are massive tombs built for Pharaoh. And these are colossal structures. And they were the tallest structures in the world, the Great Pyramids at Giza, right here, were the tallest structures in the world until the building of the Eiffel Tower in the late uh, 19th century in Europe. And these strangely, uh, most people would say, well, who built the pyramids? And most people would say, well, slaves, of course. However, slaves did not, for the most part, build pyramids. That this is what you did in the off-season. When you weren't farming, you would go and work on Pharaoh's pyramid. You would go and work on Pharaoh's tomb. Um, because this is how dedicated that people were in Egypt to uh, believing that their their god king would help them in the afterlife. God, their god king would help them in, in uh, this world, that that would help bring blessings upon the land, that they would bring fertility, that they would all, well not all, but they would show up in these work gangs and they would help build pyramids. But uh, the first builder of the pyramid was Imhotep, and he was... Uh, um, he was not a pharaoh himself, but he was the vizier of Egypt, kind of the prime minister of Egypt. And he he began building these great pyramids, designs these pyramids. He was really a renaissance man who was able um, to come up with these new architectural designs and mathematical uh, uh, formulas in order to build this, this, uh, this pyramid. And I remember the amount of wealth that you would have to build these kinds of things. At the, at the end of the Old Kingdom, there sort of comes this time, a, a Middle Kingdom, where everything collapses. That there's this period of time where there's immense distrust, and you see a transformation from stone construction into one of mud brick again. We don't really have many of the structures uh, that were built of mud brick. Um, but I think in many ways that this... The Middle Kingdom is sort of a metaphor for the age. For the age, it went from a time of stone construction to mud brick. That it was a time that it was a, a failed government and immense distrust and and uh, just a collapse of of uh, ruling uh, dynasties and such in Egypt's time period. So we see here a, a changing, and one of these things uh, that that uh, happens in Egypt that is really interesting. It's called the, the period of the Hyksos. And this is a group of people who immigrate, invade. We're not sure exactly what happens, but this is they're called the Shepherd Kings by later Egyptians. Um, and they come into Egypt and they conquer um, all of the Nile Delta region, right? The lower Egypt. And uh, they move the capital of Egypt from Memphis to Avaris. And they were possibly the ancient Israelites, or a group of, of uh, Palestinian peoples. Um, but certainly the Egyptians saw them as invaders. And they were great charioteers, they were great warriors, and they did for a time rule over Egypt. And perhaps this memory of these, of these people, the Hyksos, um, who were bearded Canaanite-looking peoples, um, they, it, it's perhaps memorialized within um, the Hebrew, the Israelite Old Testament, that uh, the exodus of 
the Pentateuch of the of the Old Testament in the Christian Bible, where the Egyptians are th are uh, escape four hundred years slavery in Egypt um, and are sent to the Promised Land, uh, being driven out by Pharaoh or, or uh, being uh, led out by Moses um, and pursued by Pharaoh. They cross the Red Sea uh, miraculously through the help of their God. And um, this perhaps preserves this memory of this kind of period of expulsion of the Hyksos. Then we come to the period of the New Kingdom. And this was a time, again, of a rapid expansion. That uh, we went from the unsure, terrible period of the Middle Kingdom to one of, one of stable government once again within Egypt. Um, and this is where Egypt is going to expand almost all the way uh, to all of uh, uh, throughout the ancient Near East. Uh, for a time, it will even control uh, most of uh, Mesopotamia, not uh, entirely, um, but uh, Egypt is going to become the premier power. And remember last time I said that Egypt, the Hittites, Assyria, and, uh, and Babylon are going to five for power, and each one for a time would, would control. Well, this is really the golden age of Egypt uh, when, they would, uh, when they had immense control over all the dealings in the Fertile Crescent, politically. And one of its greatest kings is Ramses the Great. So if anybody, uh, if you see a statue in ancient Egypt, you probably have seen one of uh, Ramses the Great. And he himself uh, fathered uh, more than 100 children, uh, had uh, many wives, and he was an, an immense builder. He won the great battle of Kadesh, which I will link uh, another video to if, uh, over between the Hittites. And um, uh, he was a great conqueror and, and the hero of his age. And we must speak, of course, of the Valley of the Kings, and these. this is um, an area in the New Kingdom the pharaohs didn't build pyramids anymore because when you build pyramids and you fill them with lavish grave goods, then they tend to get stolen when everything, when uh, uh, political order breaks down, like in the Middle Kingdom. Therefore, it becomes a good idea to hide your tomb. So this is a way that they would preserve their burial goods, which the Egyptians believed that they needed um, for the uh, for the the uh, afterlife. And Howard Carter actually makes a great discovery, and he will, uh, we will come to him. I'll come back to mummification in a moment. But Howard Carter in 1924 uh, discovers one tomb that had not been ransacked. Uh, for all their efforts in the Valley of the Kings, the pharaohs, uh, were, all their tombs were destroyed. They were looted uh, as time went on, and only one tomb have we discovered, and this was Howard Carter's great discovery in 1924, of an extremely unimportant pharaoh, King Tutankhamun, and he, yes, a boy pharaoh who uh, his his uh, grave goods were hastily thrown together, and it was the most lavish find. It was the discovery of archaeology of the 20th century, and. This is, is uh, the massive amount of grave goods that we have. You can see some of the pictures here. Only three rooms. And some of the great pharaohs like Ramesses um, would have hundreds of rooms that would be filled with things and, and, and uh, with, with, with lavish goods. Gold-covered coffins. So you can only imagine what would have been in a truly great pharaoh's tomb um, when you see what was in someone who was just of complete unimportance um, within the, the, the ruling dynasty of Egypt, who died very early in his reign. So, um, excuse me, I need to go back to mummification. So within these tombs, of course, was the preserved body, that uh, mummification was a type of embalming, that uh, it sought to preserve the body because Egyptians believed that this body would be needed in the afterlife, that you're, you would be restored to life. Remember, life, death, then rebirth. So the Egyptian gods, once you got transferred to the, the um, afterlife, that the, the soul, the ka, which the Egyptians called it, um, was, would be reborn into your body if you uh, were seen to be successful. 
And so how do you have a successful outcome in the afterlife? Well, you need to behave very well in the, uh, in the world, in this life, in the, li the, the, the land and the life of the living. But the Egyptians put together this great, this great uh, compilation of prayers and things that you could use, a road map basically to, uh, to guide you through this, this journey in, in the afterlife, to get you to paradise. And so you will be reading this, and this is, is very much what it is designed to do. It is, is, um, is the key to passing over into the afterlife. So you would, um, after death, you would have to um, move through a series of judgments where you would literally take your heart out and it would be weighed. And then you would have to swear an oath of negative confession before a convened council of the 42 gods of Egypt where King Osiris himself, the, the, the king of the dead, was present. And then you would be asked a series of questions like, have you murdered people? Have you sinned against orphans? Um, have you stolen? Have you sinned against the gods? Have you committed adultery? Have you bullied the poor? Have you cheated anyone? Um, have you caused anyone to starve? Have you taken milk from babies? And at the end, you would recite, if you have answered no to all these questions, you would say, I am pure, I am pure, I am pure. At which point, your oath is either accepted by the gods or it is not, and you are cast into the abyss where you are devoured. Your soul is devoured by a giant crocodile-like monster called Amat. So again, virtue key in life here to getting to paradise. So have some fun with the Book of the Dead uh, as we look at this. Uh, and uh, I hope you have come to understand just a little bit about uh, Egyptian culture and the development of ancient Egypt uh, in the ancient world. So until next time, uh, go read and enjoy yourself immensely.